Homo homini homus, men are wolves to men, a phrase coined by Roman playwright Plautus in his masterful work Asinaria, a tragic tale about family betrayal and the predatory instinct that humans appear to have toward other humans. A noteworthy phenomenon due to the fact that predatory behavior is usually non-existent between the same species. The phrase tragically extends beyond the scope of fiction and may possibly describe the relationship between human beings, a relationship apparently doomed to follow the evolutionary territoriality of its ancestors, territoriality no longer for natural resources but for our own individual non-coinciding desires. Humans are inherently violent, no doubt, but to be peaceful is exclusively human. Violence is not the ultimate human endeavor that belongs to happiness. Violence might prove to be a successful way to achieve individual perceptions of happiness, whatever those may be. But individuality makes one forget that in such a game, victories always claim at the loss of another. By understanding the origins of violence, the ultimate antagonist of human happiness, can we even start to venture into the construction of peace? Men are not wolves to all men, as evidenced by those who turn their heads the other way. Men are just wolves when they haven't yet found their humanity. Biology is intrinsically intertwined with violence, yet we don't consider animals evil despite their predatory stratagems, reminiscent of human warfare. But warfare is indisputably evil to us all. Evidently, biology does not grant us with answers for our concepts of good and evil. You may argue that animals are weighed free from descriptions of evil due to their lack of conscience and control over their evolutionary mechanisms. But how much control do we humans really have? Our self-induced atrocities tell us that being human does not equate to being instinct-free. We are at the mercy of our own instincts, and by understanding these processes, do we even begin to understand our own behavior? From this stems our fascination with violence. From the epics of Gilgamesh, to William Shakespeare, to Picasso's Guernica, the human condition is a constant battle between instinct and rationality. But that's for the individual. How about for the whole? Natural selection works on the individual and ignores the species because the survival of the individual is the survival of the species. Altruism is a rare occurrence in nature, making human altruism even more equated with humanity. Current theory is this. The development of language 100,000 years ago made human altruistic simply by chance. The individuals who communicated share a higher sex rate of survival than its pre-linguistic counterpart, favoring language and altruistic behavior in the next generation. Resources are of course always limited, those altruistic behavior came in at expense when the populations became too large, resulting in the divergence of large populations into isolated tribes. In populations where its size and the quantity of its resources made altruistic behavior beneficial, altruism became a moral prerequisite when societies began to form and with them the emergence of their cultures. This is the context in which most of the human beings ever born found themselves in. Competition always an unavoidable factor, but instead of competing with each other, intertribal members figured that together they were able to accomplish far greater feats than any individual will have been capable of alone. Violence within tribes are almost at a non-existent level, pressured also by the moral values within them. Professor Sarah Matthews explains further. There is a form of cooperation. Individuals have to risk their personal fitness in order to benefit the group, and natural selection typically doesn't favor this kind of behavior. For example, cowards, laggards, and deserters on Turkana raids face these moral punitive sentiments, they face the moral wrath of their community members, and this is what makes them risk their lives in combat. 
The Turkana, a large nomadic tribe in the arid regions of Kenya, gives us a better understanding of our pre-organ violin tendencies. Only 1% of adult male mortality in Turkana is due to one Turkana killing the other, another Turkana, and 50% is due to intertribal warfare. Of course, we cannot talk about human psychology without discussing Sigmund Freud and his quintessential essay, Civilization and its Discontents. Freud traces modern human violence to conflicts between this psychology of the tribal man and the recent mass urbanization, where man now stands alone without a tribe other than his or her own family, if he has any family living close to him or her. The recentness of the emergence of cities 8,000 years ago made our present day a tiny portion of the evolutionary history puts humans at an ease. Cities are not the natural habitat for the individual. In an arena full of strangers, men think of themselves as tribes of one, where natural resources are replaced with monetary wealth and competition like the days of old heightens our instinctive senses. On top of that, we are doomed to see the world through our own individual lenses, not fully aware of the other's loss in the same predatory game where one's victory is the death of another. But society condemns physical violence, therefore in a stable society, most violence is either internalized or externalized in a verbal and emotional form. Despite this, physical crime is not extinct. The reasons vary, but they are again intrinsically biological. So violence. And so the question that I've been looking at is, you know, what discriminates or what difference is there between somebody who will take a life and somebody who's relatively normal? Of 41 murderers, is that there was a distinct lack of activity in the prefrontal cortex. Prefrontal cortex deficiency might be an attributable factor to malnutrition. Professor Edwin Rain provides a solution. Two randomized controlled trials has been shown to reduce serious offending in the prison by around 34%. And what would be so wrong about giving better nutrition, not just to felons, but what about the next generation of young kids that's abnormal violence. The type of violence we're dealing with is the violence present in us all. The tribe to try warfare became international warfare with the same mechanisms of morality in those people into war. Individually, we're so dear to our tribalism that we invent some upon the foundations of minuscule differences. Race, religion, ethnicity, we like to group each other and bash the other group. It seems as though the mechanisms of our evolution control our behavior even to this day. But humanity has always been about redefining evolutionary trends through knowledge and introspection. The Enlightenment didn't necessarily bring peace, but the majority of human beings who ever existed never had the ability to discuss philosophy or scientific theories. Most humans who ever lived were illiterate. The Enlightenment was no different, it did bring an end to slavery and establish modern democracy. But it did lead to a near world ending conflict. The Cold War was a turning point. The Apollo space program did not only heighten our optimism for the potential of mankind, it gave us this perspective. We, in advanced civilization, are pointing ourselves with life eradicating weapons. How different is this advanced civilization from extinctive animals? This is a picture taken by the Voyager space probe on February of 1971. It is the furthest picture ever taken from Earth. From this vantage point, all of our differences disappear with the resolution of the image. Human altruism is a product of tribalism, yet is also the ether for our violence. If we saw each other in the nature of our planet as one coinciding tribe, maybe there is hope to a violentless world. The internet and mass media are tools to propagate ideas that were once inaccessible to the majority of mankind. Ideas that at their respective times established peace. The truly violent thing would be to be violent today, when one can truly exercise their empathy through countless mediums. Slavery, once a great immovable economic market of the era, became an obsolete idea in the span of a century. How far-fetched is it to say that war will become obsolete in the next century? How far will our nomadic species improve peace within the next millennia? Violence is not human after all, it's a mechanism of our past, glued to us presently but removable through effort and humanity. We only need to look at ourselves more often and learn from those who turn their heads the other way. From this distant vantage point, the Earth might not seem of any particular interest. But for us, it's different. Consider again that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. 
On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a mote of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings. How eager they are to kill one another. How fervent their hatreds. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe, are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. The Earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit? Yes. Settle? Not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known.